Welcome to the Tree of Life podcast. I'm here with Professor Jonathan Eisen. Welcome, Jonathan Eisen. Glad to be here. So um, you, could you please uh, tell us a little bit about your history at UC Davis, how you got here, and what your current position is? Yeah, so um, currently I have appointments in many different places. I'm in the Department of Evolution and Ecology, the Department of Medical Microbiology and Immunology, and the Genome Center. And if you combine all of those words together. What I work on is the evolution and ecology of microbes and their genomes. And I came to Davis in 2006. And before that, I spent eight years at a big genome sequencing center called TIGER, the Institute for Genomic Research in Maryland. Wow, nice. So um, with those diverse set of interests, is it ever hard to find collaborator collaborators or connections between all those different fields? Yeah, it's sort of the opposite. I mean, what I'm interested in is the diversity of microbes and their interactions with other organisms. And because microbes are found everywhere and on everything, and because now lots of people are interested in those microbes that are found in all sorts of different places, we uh, interact with and collaborate with people working on plants and soil and humans and the bottom of the ocean and the space station and all sorts of other places. Wow. So we we have no lack of things to do. Nice. That's, that's amazing to find all those um, connections. Um, well, today I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the Tree of Life and the history of the Tree of Life. And one of the things that I think about when I think about the Tree of Life is just trying to communicate the importance of understanding relationships in the tree of life to um, you know, non-biologists, but also sort of, you know, tying that into, you know, why is that, why is it at all really important to understand the tree of life in general for biologists in general? Yeah, I mean, I think there are two main aspects to this that I and a lot of other people talk about, which is there's a basic science value in just understanding biology and its history and the relationships among organisms and the importance of basic science is in part not trying to predict what its value is to any particular area but just the benefit of understanding and you know the history of life is an important and interesting thing and the tree of life is how we represent that history but actually most of my career I have spent working on the applied benefits of understanding evolutionary relationships among organisms and evolutionary relationships among genes. And, you know, there are many applied benefits. So if we want to predict the biology of an organism, one of the best ways to do it is to know what it's related to and what other features of related organisms have been studied. And so people appreciate this pretty well for multicellular Right. feathery, fluffy, <laughs> leafy organisms. There's, I mean, it's just been a general appreciation of the importance of an evolutionary perspective. Less so among microbes historically, but a growing appreciation of that. So that's basically what I work on is how we can use information about the tree of life to better understand biology, predict biology, predict um, reactions to things like climate change and antibiotics and so on. Oh, that's great. Yeah, so I, I think when I, th when I think about it, one of the things that uh, it helps me with is just sort of keeping myself in perspective in the context of the tree of life, maybe not take myself too seriously. You know, we're one branch on, a, you know, an enormous amount of uh, biological diversity. So Yeah, and the same thing, of course, is true for other organisms. So for many years, um, most of the microbes were, that were studied were just a couple of key landmark organisms, um, E. coli, Bacillus subtilis, yeast, and a few others. And what's amazing now is that, you know, we now understand there are hundreds to thousands of major branches in the microbial tree. I mean, these are phyla of microbes, and mostly we know nothing about most of those. Right, and and I know that the the 2016 work by Laura Hug and Jill Banfield sort of really put put a good marker on that. Yeah, I actually teach a upper level class Eve 161, where last time I taught it, the entire course was wrapped around that paper by Laura Hug et al. Um, and we did a, sort of an examination of sequencing and microbiology, but all using that paper as our guide. Wow, that's that's great. So segueing on yeah. that then, so some of the key players in the history of the development of the Tree of Life have been interesting. Among them, um, Carl Bose, of course, and we've, I've, you know, in your classes, we've 
talked about Carl Woese and his importance. And, you know, he has um, kind of a reputation, too, of being a little bit cranky. And I just I, I wonder, um, can you kind of elaborate on the significance of Carl Woese's work briefly? I know it's a lot, but maybe briefly, what's that? What's his connection to understanding the tree of life? Yeah, I mean, just as an aside, I have a blog uh, called The Tree of Life, where I write about a lot of things. And one day, many years ago, I got an email from Mr. Cranky, from from Carl Woese, thanking me for the blog and for the things I was writing about. And I cherish that um, email. Um, this was a few years before he died. Uh, so Carl Woese's contribution here was, you know, in concept, really one thing but in practice many. Um, so the concept was that prior to his work, which started really in the 1970s for um, the Tree of Life, most of what we represented with the Tree of Life, including microbes in that tree, was not based actually on data. And so people tried to build trees of life where they included all organisms in that tree. And that was very hard because they didn't know how to place bacteria relative to other organisms. They didn't know how to classify all the different types of bacteria and where they would fit in the tree. They didn't even know for most microbes of any kind what to do with them. And so a lot of the way the tree of life was drawn was based upon theoretical models. Like we look at these organisms and let's come up with a hypothesis that could say where they should fit on the tree of life. But there wasn't data to test that. And what Woese really realized and what he transformed for the Tree of Life was to say, maybe there are ways we can actually get data to compare all organisms on the planet at one time. And what he did was he basically um, looked into the cells of different organisms and said, you know, what do they have in common? And there were lots of features that people knew that they had in common the way replication works and transcription works and translation and cell envelopes and a few other things that it seemed like all cellular organisms had in common. And at the time, the easiest one of those to characterize in more detail was the RNA component of the ribosome, the ribosomal RNA. And what he figured out how to do was to physically isolate, so crack open cells, physically isolate them, uh, the, the ribosomes from those cells separate out the different components of the ribosome, which is many proteins and a couple of RNA molecules, and then run these chemical reactions, which were, you know, loaded with radioactivity and a mess and dangerous and scary and, um, and read tiny little pieces of the string of letters, the sequence of these RNA molecules, eight, six to eight bases at a time. And then he built a table of this for organism one and organism two and organism three and organism four. And then he worked on methods to compare that list of, you know, A, A, C, C, G, G, T, or U, actually, um, in organism one to other organisms. And when they did this, they found something striking. That's, so, so the concept was, let's get data to compare all organisms on the planet. And the finding that was striking was that Organisms that had previously been lumped together into prokaryotes, organisms without nuclei, appeared to come in two different forms. Right. And um, eventually this led to them proposing the existence of a third branch on the tree of life, which was originally named the Archaebacteria. Sadly, it was meant to distinguish them from bacteria, so including bacteria in the name was not the smartest idea in the world. Um, and then they renamed them the archaea. So that led to basically the division of life into three main, what are called domains, the eukaryotes or eukarya, the bacteria, and the archaea. Yeah, that's, yeah, the, the discovery of archaea. When I think of Carl Woese, I think of the discovery of archaea. But one of the things that stands out to me is in this story, um, I, you know, talk to my students about how he kind of, not violated precedent, but, um, you know, by going and making a big press announcement without really giving other people a chance and then to, to comment on the findings and then having, you know, the newspapers maybe take it and spin it in a way that wasn't quite accurate. I wonder how that really affected long term the perception of him amongst the scientific community. Yeah, I'm, I'm you know, I was... Uh 
nine years old or something. I mean, you know, like, so uh, this made the front cover of the New York Times. I mean, the front page, right? The discovery of a third branch on the Tree of Life and got a lot of press coverage in lots of places. And I think, um, you know, whenever that happens, um, some people get excited about it. Some people get angry about it. Some people say, you know, uh, we're not ready for that, like you were implying. Mm -hmm. And um, there's lots of things that come with it. But um, if you look at the history of evolution and the history of evolutionary biology, it's, it's not too often that a major evolutionary finding is on the cover of the New York Times. Right. Um, so I think bringing attention to that area was probably in the end a really, really useful thing. And, you know, microbiologists had been probably thinking about this for a while, but the people who worked on multicellular, uh, fluffy, leafy, right. um, mushroomy organisms probably hadn't really been thinking about the deep, deep branches in the tree of life much. And I think that this helped. So um, branching off of Carl Wos without using too much of a pun there, um, one of the things that I think about sort of, you know, post the invention of PCR, given that he did all this work effectively by hand, is, you know, microbiologists trying to overcome um, working with pure cultures. And when I think of, you know, going straight to an environment and using culture independ independent studies, the person that comes to my mind um, is Norman Pace, although I know other people were probably investigating these kinds of um, approaches at the same time. Um, Norman Pace sort of stands out and seemed to really advocate for a lot of Carl Wos's work and um, expanded on his tree. And so I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about the significance of Norman Pace and maybe put that in the context of you know, culture independence as a whole. Yeah, so actually, interestingly, Norm Pace's work preceded PCR, and it was really hard okay. before PCR was invented. So what Pace and colleagues basically did was they said, okay, here is this approach of using ribosomal RNA sequences to infer relationships among organisms, and it's amazing because all cellular organisms have these ribosomal RNAs, and if you can read their sequence of their ribosomal RNAs, you can build an evolutionary tree and place any cellular organism on the planet into that evolutionary tree by getting that data. And that's you know really powerful. You can go out and collect leaves and tissue from animals, but for microbes, that's more challenging. And the way most of the data was obtained for microbes, or in fact all of the data, was originally from organisms that were grown in pure culture in the laboratory because that allowed them to get enough sample. Like if you go collect a leaf, you get a lot of material and you can get the ribosomes out right. of it or DNA out of it. But for microbes at the time, that was you had to grow a batch of them and that was done by culturing. And yet people were starting to realize that there were a lot of microbes out there that we either hadn't yet grown in the laboratory or might never be able to be grown right. in the laboratory. And what Pace and colleagues did was they said, uh, we should be able to get ribosomal RNA out of anything on the planet. Let's just go to environmental samples, grind them up without ever growing them in the laboratory, and extract the ribosomes and read the sequence of those ribosomes. And the main challenge of this, why PCR was so helpful in the long run, but they did this before PCR, was you now have multiple versions of the same type of ribosomal RNA within an individual sample. And Pace and colleagues figured out ways to separate them from each other prior to PCR hmm. and read sequence data from them. They originally did this with symbionts of hydrothermal vent tube worms. Um, and then they did this with some very simple biofilms from Yellowstone microbial mats. And they were able to show that they could figure out what evolutionary types of organisms were present in these samples, even without growing them in the lab. And they did that by looking at the RNA. Okay. What PCR was revolutionary was it enabled people to um, go to any type of sample, including environmental samples, but also actually cultured organisms, and make billions and billions of copies of the genes for the ribosomal RNA, that is the ribosomal RNA genes, and then read the sequence of those. And in this case, then you could circumvent the difficult labor-intensive part of you know, physically isolating ribosomes, separating out the different components of the ribosomes, doing all this right. work, 
with one reaction in one test tube over three hours. Right, just over a matter of hours, yeah. right. <laughs> and I, I, I actually did ribosomal RNA gene PCR in 1989, shortly after PCR was automated with PCR machines, and I learned um, what primers to use from Norm Pace and colleagues, because they oh, had wow. been developing okay. the primers, and I did this for as an undergraduate for a project, I sequenced one single ribosomal RNA gene from a bacterial symbiont of a clam, and I got a paper out of that. Wow, that's amazing. That's and, amazing. and now students in my lab sequence billions of ribosomal RNA genes, and it's hard to get a paper out of that. Right, yeah, no, I, I, I totally understand. I spent five years sequencing five genes yeah. <laughs> for, you know, 50 different terminal spider taxa, and now it could all be done on one plate. Yeah. Right. So, um, okay, well that, um, so then the, the next step that I always think of, um, even though it's a sort of a gigantic leap, is really connected to, to just the cost effectiveness of whole genome sequences and whole genome approaches. And, you know, the, the, the Hug et al. paper really stands out to me as a major leap forward, you know, combining, um, you know, work that had been done over several preceding years with work that they had been doing for several years and coming up with sort of a new version of the tree of life. Maybe, um, you know, how, how do you, how do you, th you know, how do you think all of these three are connected? What do you think the, the new, um, you know, the new story of the tree of life here it is with, with that, with that paper? Yeah. I mean, so the paper would, the reason I use it in this class and that I think it's really great is that um, it covers what I consider the four eras of microbial sequencing really well. Really well. So we've talked about two of them, the Woe's tree of life, which is ribosomal RNA from cultured organisms, and then the PACE and colleagues extension of that to get ribosomal RNAs from environmental samples. And then a part we haven't talked about is just genome sequencing of cultured organisms. Mm. And then what Hug et al., most of their data came from doing genome sequencing of environmental samples. And the, the reason that genome sequencing is so important is that um, even though ribosomal RNA is really useful for inferring phylogeny, it is imperfect. Mm. Um, it is uh, uh, sometimes you build trees with ribosomal RNAs and you get the wrong answer. Mm -hmm. Some organisms have acquired ribosomal RNA genes from other species and then the phylogenetic tree of those is confusing as to what it means for phylogeny. And um, sometimes you can't obtain ribosome RNA genes from certain organisms. So some organisms, PCR does not work very well for their ribosome RNA genes. So all of those things together are why when we want to understand the tree of life, genomes are in incredibly important and powerful. And um, sometimes you get slightly different answers than you would get with ribosome RNA. And just like with ribosome RNA, um, getting genomes from organisms from cultured organisms does not provide us with a full picture of the diversity of life. So we want to get genomes from an, organisms in the environment. And that paper is really important because it covers all of those things. Right. And so with, um, so I guess one intermediate step between that, you know, kind of connects those two that I wanted to kind of go back to a little bit is just the discovery of, you know, the Asgard archaea and how that affects our interpretation of maybe what eukaryotes even are as a whole um, and maybe connect that to the the new view of the tree of life which you know it is at least reflected in a paraphyletic archaea um, yeah I wonder if you could comment on that yeah so I mean if we go back to the Woes original uh, papers. Uh, it was actually Woes and Fox, so George right. Fox gets neglected from this. Yeah, um, that's too bad. <laughs> and then a Fox et al. paper um, and with multiple other authors. And they basically read ribosome RNA sequences from about 13 organisms on the planet and came up with this conclusion that there were three main branches in the tree of life. And um, I hope that people can appreciate that 13 organisms are not representative of all of the diversity of life. And so the question that has come up is, you know, it certainly seems like they were pretty accurate with the data that they had and with the inferences that they could make from that data. But if you collect ribosomal RNA data from other organisms, um, does that always give you the same picture? And um, for a long time, people felt like it still did. 
And what changed was really, I mean, there were proposals for alternative pictures that people were, you know, not sure what they meant and how to interpret them. But what really changed was getting um, genomic data from these environmental samples. And when um, people did that, uh, and, and with ribosome RNA data, there was one branch of archaea at the time that people were really interested in because they had some features that were unusual and they had some... In phylogenetic trees, sometimes something seemed a little amiss with them. And then um, a couple of groups, not actually in this Hug et al. paper, but an, another separate group um, said, let's try and get genome sequences from this weird branch of archaea. Mm -hmm. And none of them had been grown in the laboratory, so they had to go to environmental samples. And they used the methods like in the Hug et al. paper to try and piece together the genome of a few of these organisms. And when when they did that, and when they built evolutionary trees based upon those genomes, they said, uh-oh. Uh um, I mean, they had hints of this before, so it wasn't completely surprising. But they said, actually, we get a slightly different answer. Mm -hmm. We don't have three major branches in the tree of life. Um, eukaryotes actually appear to be branching in the middle of what we would otherwise call archaea. So there's two groups of prokaryotes. That's still clear. Um, the bacteria branch seems to be consistent with ribosome RNA data and genomic data. It always shows up as a monophyletic clade. But the other organisms without nuclei, the other archaea, now have something weird going on with mm. this data, which is that there's one branch of the archaea, the Asgard archaea, as they are known now. It was originally um, the Loki archaea. There right. was uh, organisms from this one deep sea hydrothermal vent site called Loki's castle. And that organism became known as the Loki archaea, or that group, the Loki archaea. And when they built evolutionary trees, eukaryotes were now sister to the Loki archaea, to the exclusion of all other archaea. That mm -hmm. is, the archaea were no longer a monophyletic group. And um, this has been supported by subsequent studies. Now they have representatives of the Thor archaea, the um, Hela archaea, the Odin archaea, and a few others. Um, and that group, the Asgard archaea, as they are known now, appears to be more closely related to the eukaryotic nucleus mm -hmm. than any other group of archaea or bacteria are. Right, and so the work that I've read specifically mentions like nuclear pore nuclear pores, proteins and nuclear pores being homologous to genes and archaea. Yeah, so, I mean, for years, people had um, noticed that some archaea had genes that previously had then been thought to only be found in eukaryotes or had genes for which their version of that gene was way more similar to the eukaryotic version than it was to the bacterial version of that gene. And people have wondered about this. Why would we only see this in some branches of archaea and not in others? But this was sporadic data, like one gene at a time or two genes at a time. And what the genomes now help resolve is if you build an evolutionary tree with conserved genes found across all taxa, these groups appear to be more closely related to the eukaryotes. And then you can hunt inside those genomes and say, oh my God, here's yet another set of genes that previously were thought to be signatures of eukaryotes <laughs> that are in fact not signatures of eukaryotes. <laughs> right. So that feature, like some aspects of the nuclear pore, some aspects of the cytoskeleton, some aspects of other types of machinery that previously were thought to have originated in the branch leading to the common ancestor of eukaryotes, actually originated in the branch leading to the common ancestor of Asgard, Archaea, and eukaryotes. That's amazing. Okay, so I guess the last question I really have for you is, what do you, what do you think's next? You know, what's, what, what's the trajectory now on the tree of life? Where are we going? Yeah, I mean, I think um, it's important to remember that what people are trying to resolve here is events that happened literally billions of years ago. And we still don't have an incredibly deep sampling of organisms. I mean, we have, you know, 10 genomes from the Asgard archaea, not even from cultured organisms. So the way we piece together those genomes is a little challenging and mm -hmm. they may be imperfect. There was just a report for the first time ever of someone claiming to have cultured a representative of the Asgard archaea. It's not yet peer reviewed. It's posted mm -hmm. 
as a preprint on this oh, right. server called BioArchive. Um, so we don't we really don't know a lot about that group. Um, and there are a lot of lineages of bacteria and archaea as represented in that Hug et al. paper, for example, for which we've only found out about in the last couple of years. So one of the reasons that Hug et al. paper is really interesting is that the ribosomal RNA PCR that people were using with so-called universal primers that people thought could amplify PCR genes from any organism in a sample don't work with a huge fraction of the diversity of life. You miss anything from those organisms and the only thing we know about them has come from genomes because most of them have not been cultured hmm. and so you know this is like five years old right, right. and um, I think that I would reserve judgment on <laughs> the accuracy of the tree of life and also importantly as you know we talk about on and off in bis 2c but is really important to remember it is not a tree right so eukaryotes are the merging of two lineages right. um, this Asgard archaea and the uh, ancestor of the mitochondria. And then gene transfer happens all the time. Other mm -hmm. types of merging and symbioses happen across plants and across all these other lineages. And working backwards from today to these events in the past is, is very, very challenging. And I think, you know, new statistical methods to analyze the data and new data sets are, I guarantee, that the representation that we have of the tree of life right now um, will be uprooted <laughs> in the next few years in some way that is interesting. Oh, that's great. Well, I look forward to uh, seeing the future revisions and uh, definitely appreciate you coming on and um, hope to see you around on campus soon. Yeah, glad to be here. Thank you. You're welcome.